All right, uh, hi everyone. Today we will be covering advanced probability. Uh, we didn't have class this Friday due to some complications. Uh, sorry for the late notice, uh, but uh, this is basically just gonna be a recording of what we should have covered on Friday, and you can expect a quiz on this either today, the day it's posted, that'd be Saturday, 11.21, or 11.22 on Sunday. The latest would be Monday, but I doubt, I doubt it'll be Monday. So this presentation is just basically going to cover combinations, factorials, and basic geometry. We're also going to go over expected value, and these are all things you're expected to know in math counts. Uh, I'll start off with expected value. So in order to find expected value, we first multiply the value of an event by the probability of that event occurring. Then we take the sum of these events to find the expected value. Let's work through some examples. Before we jump into the examples, I just wanted to go over the definition really quickly. I kind of skipped that. Expected value is not used to find whatever has the highest probability, but it's basically to find the average using the individual weights of all the components. That really helps us. So let's find the expected value of rolling a dice. Well, first of all, let's write out the values. So what would rolling a dice give us? All right. So I know that I can get a one, two, three, four, five, and six. But what is the probability that each one gets rolled? It, well, if we're gonna assume that it's a fair dice, which the problem will usually tell you, then we can assume it's one six. Even if the problem doesn't tell you it's fair, you, you should always assume that it's fair unless straight, like explicitly stated that it's not fair or there's specific weightages, like a weighted coin or a weighted die or something along those lines. Anyway, now what we're gonna do is multiply every single value. So one times one six is one six. 2 times 1 6 is 2 6, which is 1 third. 3 times 1 6 is 3 6, which is 1 half. 4 times 1 6, and we're just going to continue all of that. We're just going to multiply every single value. And here's a trick, all right? There's really no need to add up all of these fractions because that would just be a waste of time. And in math counts test, time is really, really, really important. So here's something I would do. I know that 1 6 plus 5 6 is 1, and I also know that 1 3rd plus 2 thirds is 1, and I know that there's a 1 at the very end. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, and I know that there's a 1 half remaining. So I can easily find, without wasting any time, that the answer is 3 1 half. That is our expected value. So now that you kind of understand the basics of ex expected value, let's try some more difficult expected value problems. I'm at the fair and I want to play a game. This game has three prices in cash a dollar, five, and 50. Winning $1 has a 1 half probability. Winning five bucks is three eighth and winning 50 is one eighth. Determine the expected value of the cash prize you win. All right, so let's first list out all the different values. I can win $1, $5 or $50. And I want the probabilities now. So for $1, I know that the probability is one half since it's given five, three eighths and 50, one eighth, all right? So now that I listed out these basics, uh, I should be able to find it. So one half times one is one half. Five times three eight is 15 over eight. And 50 uh, times one eighth is 50 over eight. So if I add all of these up, I should get, okay, so let's do 50 plus 15 over eight, that's 65 over eight. And one half can be four over eight, so it's 69 over eight. And if the if problem asks you to express it as in, as a improper, uh, well, this is an improper fraction. As a mixed fraction, then you should get eight five eight. So it's pretty noticeable that this isn't even a given value or a given price. So I just want to reiterate on this: expected value is is kind of just an average individually based on weightage. It's not really supposed to be a value exactly. I'm gonna move on to the next problem. So now that you know a little bit more about expected value, I think we can move on to normal probability. So now we're gonna focus on problems that have normal probability, and this would just be finding the problems, I mean, just be finding the probability of events that already occur, I mean, occur. This could be simple, like finding the probability of a coin flip, like if it lands heads, in which we know that's one half, obviously. In more advanced problems, we use permutations and combinations. In permutations, Order matters in combination order doesn't matter. You might not understand that right now, but I'll help you understand that. So in permutation, when order matters, it means like different thing, okay, different rules. For example, if I was had a board of 10 people, all right, and I, I wanted to choose three, then I would use combinations because 
those three don't really have a specific order. So it doesn't really matter who gets chosen for who. But if I had permutations and each of these roles were given different um, roles like president, vice president, chairman, then I would need to use combinate uh, permutations because the order in this case, in that case, would matter. Let's move on to a problem. All right, so Jeremy flips five coins, white probability lands all heads. In this problem, we can use combinatorics, but we won't because sometimes we just need to use a little bit of common sense. So, what's the probability that he lands heads on the first coin? It's one half, all right? What's the probability he lands heads on the second coin? One half. We're gonna keep on doing this. Third coin, one half, fourth coin, one half, fifth coin, one half, all right? So the probability that he lands all heads is one fifth to the power of five, and that's just equal to one over 32, all right? So you could do this in other ways, like using a tree diagram, but that would be really, really tedious. So it's way better to do this. And uh, some of you may not understand how I got one of these, but I'm just gonna explain that a little more in a little more detailed fashion. If I have a coin, right, if I flip it, then there's a one half chance I can get heads or tails. Let's say, and I only want heads, so there's one half chance I'll get heads, right? Second, second coin, if I flip that, right, there's a one half chance I, one half chance I can get heads or tails. Let's say I get heads, all right? There's a one half chance that I got heads on the first coin, all right? And then there's another one half chance that I got heads on the second coin. So what I'm doing is I'm multiplying these because there's a total of four scenarios if I flip two coins, all right? Four scenarios. That would be heads, 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 tails, 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 heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, tails. I could go on, but I'm not. So there's, well, I think those were the four. I don't know, yeah, so uh, my bad. Yeah, those were the, um, Oh, right. I think I messed that up. That's four coins. My bad. Two coins. Two coins could be heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads. All right. So that's a total of four scenarios. But I only want heads, heads, heads. That's only one. And that's an out of total of four. Right. So you notice that when I multiply these values, I get the answer. The same goes on with three, four, or five. But it actually goes on infinitely to number n. So what I'm doing is, look, there's five coins. There's, a, there's two values for each of these coins. That means the total amount of values is 32. All right, and there is one scenario out of these 32 possible scenarios where all of them lands head, land heads. So I can say that the answer is one over 32 confidently. But this is actually a really, really simple problem. And we're just gonna move on to something a little bit more advanced. This is where we're probably gonna start using combinatorics. So Jeremy flips five coins. What, so it's basically Jeremy, he, it's the same scenario, except he wants three heads and two tails. This will be a little more difficult. And uh, here's why, because we have to calculate two different scenarios, but if you're doing this efficiently, then we're only calculating one scenario, all right? So in the formula that I showed you guys earlier, you, uh, I hope that you wrote that down. I'm actually just gonna go back to it. So uh, in case you guys need to write that down, I think that's a little bit important here. I'm gonna give you guys a second to write that down. You might wanna pause the video if you need to. So in this scenario, N, is the total, right? <clears throat> in this scenario, n is the total, uh, n is the total number of items in the sample, and r is the amount we want from the sample, like the amount we want to be selected. So let's use this. Let's use this. We can easily use this in the second pop problem. Let me show you how. All right. So I know that I want three heads and two tails. So let's choose either one of these. Let's say that instead of three, I want two, because I like dealing with lesser numbers. That just makes it easier for me personally. So I know the formula, right? And well, first of all, let's check. Does order matter here? Does order really matter? Well, order doesn't matter in this situation. And let me tell you why. I don't really care if it's heads, 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 tails, tails, or tails, heads, tails, heads, heads. I just want two tails at the end of the day, or three heads at the end of the day, three heads and two tails at the end of the day. The order in which those three heads and two tails lands doesn't really matter to me. So uh, we, just use, we just use something where order doesn't matter, and we know that in combinatorics, combinations, sorry, order does not matter. So what is n in this situation? Well, I told you guys that n is the total number of a uh, total number of uh, items in the sample, and that's five, right? So five factorial, and I believe that you guys do know what factorials are. Uh, and in case you don't know, factorials are basically just multiplying every single number to one below it. So three factorial would be three times two times one, which is six. Six factorial would be six times five times four times three times two times one, and that'd be 720. So I believe 
if you didn't know what factorials were before, now you know. Uh, R factorial. Well, what is R? I told you guys that R was the subset size. And we can either choose two or three for this one, but I'm just going to do two because I like dealing with lesser numbers. Sometimes it doesn't make a difference. Sometimes it does. And now I'm going to um, subtract the total number of things in the subset by the size. And I know that three minus two is one. I mean, sorry, five minus two is three. That's my bad. So there's five and then I'm subtracting two, so I get three. Well, let's calculate this. I know that five factorial is 120. I also know that two factorial is two and three factorial is six, so that's 10. So I get 10. I literally get, I get, uh, I literally get 10. So, uh, all right, so I get 10, all right? This is good. I know that there's 10 different scenarios when three land heads and two land tails. So that I can basically from here conclude that, from here I can basically conclude that the answer is 10 over 32. Because, because at this point, I know that there's 32 possible scenarios. We went over that in the previous problem. I told you guys that, uh, we can find the amount of possible scenarios by multiplying the total number of outputs or values by the total number of events occurring. So uh, since heads and tails are only two values, we're doing that five times, so two to the power of five is 32. There's other ways to explain it, but I think that's best. And since I know that 10 of these 32 times three heads and two tails will happen, I can simplify that to five over 16, and that is our answer. Again, if you didn't get the formula, I really suggest that you do probably just go back in the video because that's pretty important. Okay, new problem. And, and this is gonna be the final common towards problem before we move on. A board is considering a committee of four people from 11 candidates. How many different combinations of people can the board form? All right, so let's think about it, all right? Did the problem state any role, like president, vice president, chairman, organizer, random roles, all right? No, it just said four people, any four people. That means order does not matter. It can be any four people. It can be A, B, C, B, but it can also be B, C, A, D, right? The order doesn't matter. So it can it, it'd be the exact four same people, but the order doesn't matter. Now I'm gonna switch this question slightly. Like we won't solve the switch uh, version of the question, but I just want you to just understand the difference between com combinations and permutations. Let's say that uh, the first position would be president, second would be vice president, third would be chairman, and the fourth one we could say would be secretary or treasurer. Let's just, let's just do secretary, all right? Now, let's say uh, of the 11 candidates, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, and K, that only A, B, C, and D are picked because they're the best, right? So um, let's say in if there was just four people, no roles, then A, B, C, D could be picked Right, but then you could also pick B, C, A, D. The order doesn't really matter. It's still the same four people since there's no rules. But if the first, but if I change it up and say the first person picked is going to be president, second vice president, third chairman, fourth secretary, then order does matter, right? Because A, B, C, D makes it so that A is president. But if we had B, C, A, D, then a new person is president. So the committee would actually be different, right? So that's where. Uh, that's where permutations and combinations have that big difference. In this case, we see no rules. So we know that we have to use uh, combinations. So let's do that. Let's use the combinations formula. We got that last time. So we know that it's n factorial, which is the total number of subs, uh, total number of items in the list. And we know that that's 11, all right? We're gonna divide that by r factorial. We, we know that r factorial is just the items we have to pick. So that's four factorial and then seven factorial, right? No, I don't because 11 minus four is seven. I don't want to simplify this. That's really long. I mean, I do want to simplify it, but I don't want to work it out because it's really long. So what we're going to do is expand this, all right? 11, is, 11 factorial is 11 times 10 times nine times eight and so on and so on. But look at seven factorial. Seven factorial is seven times eight times nine times 11, right? Seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, right? So if we can take out that seven factorial, right? And we can cross that out with 11 factorial. So that means only eight times nine times 10 times 11 is left. You might not understand what I'm saying. So what I will do is kind of expand this nine. Oh man. 
tech issues, all right? Times nine, times eight, times seven, times six, and we're just gonna dot, dot, dot that ellipse divided by, well, let's just keep the four factorial constant, seven times six times five times four, dot, dot, dot that, all right? I can cancel everything from seven below, because look, the seven cancels with this seven, this six cancels with this six, the five cancels with uh, the five in the numerator. So that all cancels down. So that means we're only left with 11 times 10 times 9 times 8. All right? And we have four factorial left, and we can expand that too. And we know that a 4 times 2 is uh, 8. So we can take out the 8. We can take out the 4 and the 2. And we know that 3. Oh, my bad. And we know that three, we can take, we can make this, this a three in the numerator because nine divided by three is three. And we get at the end, 330. There was 330 total combinations. All right, so I'll do, I'll do something else. Now we're going to approach new probabilities here going geometric probability. So this is definitely much, much harder than the other probability you might have, like, you know, you might have, uh, you know, learned because geometric probability sometimes a little tricky. So I'm immediately going to draw a graph and you figure out why later. Let's say I give you a ticket to Disney World. Everybody loves Disney World, but there's a catch. You choose a number between zero and one, inclusive. I also do the same. Your number is X, my number is Y. If X plus two Y is greater than one, then you go to Disneyland. But what is the probability that you do, in fact, go to Disneyland? Well, the, this problem is tricky if you don't use geometric probability because there's literally infinite amount of numbers I could choose. I could do, I could choose 0 0.3, I can choose 0 0.3.14, I can choose 0 0.314159, you can choose any number too. So how in the world do I find out the probability? That's where geometric probability comes into play. So I'm just going to kind of draw benchmarks. Uh, not going to do that very well, but I'm just going to try my best. Yeah, I don't really do this extremely well, do I? Anyway, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Okay, let me just move this up. This is annoying. There. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 0. Point, I mean, that's just one. Okay, so my benchmarks are really bad. Uh, Forgive me for that. And then we know that why you can do the same. You can choose anything from that. So well, this might not be drawn exactly to scale, but I think that's okay. 0 0.6, 7, 8, 9, and 1. All right, so your number is x, and my number is y. If x plus 2y is greater than 1, then you go to Disneyland, all right? This is an equation. Let's, let's form this into an equation, all right? So let's graph the different values that are possible, all right? So I have this underlying thing, all right? The max, let's say each benchmark point represents one, all right? So the maximum I can, you can choose is one. The maximum I can choose is one. We're on the same boat. So this is the total, this is the total area, the total amount of scenarios that are possible. There can, there's literally infinite points in this one square, infinite points, all right? Because there's infinite amount, there's infinite points I can choose, infinite points you can choose. Multiply that out. There's infinite, there's infinite points within this one square. All right. So now what I'll do is I'll plot out some of these points so I can get a general idea. Right. So let's say you choose zero. All right. Let's say you choose zero, and I choose in order to in order for you to go to Disneyland, I'm gonna choose zero point five. It has to be greater than zero point five, but anything greater than zero point five, right? I'm just going to plot 0 0.5 because when you graph inequalities, uh, you, you don't really do anything greater. So 0 0.5, but that would be exclusive of 0 0.5. Now let's go 0. Point, let's, let's do 0 0.2. All right. You choose your, uh, uh, 0 0.2. And I need 0 0.8 for you to go to Disneyland, meaning I would need 0 0.4. Now that would be right here. Right here. All right. Uh, let's say you now choose 0 0.4, 
Okay, that means I would need to choose 0 0.3. Let me pull off that really quickly. You choose 0 0.6, you know that I will choose 0 0.2. You choose 0 0.8, I'll choose 0 0.1. What do we see here? Well, it might not look too good because um, of my drawings, but it's a line. If this is plotted correctly, it's literally just a line. So we literally have a linear graph. Now, mind you, this would be dotted actually since it's exclusive. It's exclusive of all the, of all the values that I pointed. But since there are literally infinite values, it wouldn't really cause a difference in the probability. It, it causes zero difference in the probability since there's infinite values, right? So now all I have to do is find the area. That's all I have to do. All I have to do is find the area. Oh, okay, that's not great. But all I have to do is find the area of the triangle since the, the, because of the entire square, the area of the triangle, every point in the area of the triangle is the only one that is the only one that satisfies the inequality. So that's all we have to do. Okay, that's simple enough, right? So the base is one, the height is 0 0.5. That's gonna give us what? 0 0.5. But we have to divide that by two since it's one half times base times height. So one half times base times height. We already got the base times height was 0 0.5 and we get 0 0.25 or, or one, one fourth. That's the answer. The answer is one fourth. Now, the, using geometric probability in this situation is much, much easier than doing anything else, all right, in this situation. So what can we conclude from this? First of all, I might add a couple geometric, uh, I'm probably only going to add one geometric problem because it's, it's just a little new territory to a lot of you guys. I might add one geometric um, probability question. And um, what basically we can conclude from this is that there's so many different kinds of probability and knowing which one to use when is really important. So let's, I'm just going to conclude a couple of things. Let me erase these for you. Okay. First thing I want to tell you guys, expected value. Let's review that really quickly before this ends. Expected value. Expected value. How do you calculate? It's kind of like the average. Um, it's, you kind of find the average uh, using individual weights. All right. And we find that I would like you to take notes. In order to find expected value, we first multiply the value of an event by the probability of that event occurring. Then we take the sum of these events to find the expected value. And then we work through two examples on that. All right? Then normal probability. Uh, so this would just be a lot of times it's just um, combinations and permutations. I gave uh, I gave you guys the formula to combination and permutation. That's right. They remember that N is the total amount of items and then R is the total amount of items selected. Now, here's a crucial thing. I also explained to you guys the difference between uh, combinations and permutations. Combinations, order doesn't matter. Permutations, order matters. Uh, uh, I'm going to reference the part where I explained the board member roles and not role if there weren't roles and there were roles. Uh, so if you want further explanation on that, I suggest that you go back to the part where I explained that. We also did uh, a couple problems on that, we did three problems. And then geometric probability, I explained that, how we basically converted the problem into an equation. And other geometric probability problems, it usually won't be an equation. Uh, it'll probably just be a scenario, but we can convert that into an equation. I'll probably just blatantly give you guys, uh, I'll probably just give you guys an equation since geometric probability is just a little tough. And uh, yeah, I think that's all we need to cover. Uh, thank you guys for uh, listening to this video. I hope all of you guys did it, did listen to this video. And uh, hopefully, well, we don't have class um, on the 27th because that's Thanksgiving. Um, Thanksgiving and yeah, happy yeah, happy really Thanksgiving, guys. Uh, happy Black Friday shopping. But yeah, I think we we should have class next year, uh, twenty twenty one, uh, because then we have we're not actually I think we have another class this year. We might. Uh, we'll let you guys. I'll let you guys know in the Theta Google Classroom. Uh, and yeah, I guess I'll see you guys. Later.